Today is day 162 of reading the entire Bible. Today we read 1 Kings 5 and 6 and then 2 Chronicles 2 and 3. These two books are offering parallel accounts and today's passages we're going to read two different kind of variant versions of Solomon building the temple. 1 Kings, remember, is dealing with the line of kings starting with Solomon's ascension to the throne at and first and second kings take us all the way to the Babylonian exile. Second Chronicles is looking at things from a perspective of Yahweh's covenant with the house of David and how the house of David versus the house of Yahweh kind of compare. So they're going to have different emphases, different details that they focus on. That said, let's dig in. Chapter five of first Kings starts off with Solomon reaching out to Hiram, king of Tyre, and connecting with him to acquire all of the materials he's going to need to build the temple. Hiram is excited to do this because he had a good working relationship with David, even though it says like he considered him a friend. It's more that they had a positive relationship between their two kingdoms, not that they were like really good buddies that went fishing on weekends or anything. And so we get a description of the materials and the exchange of goods that happened and sort of some of the logistics. So chapter six of first Kings gets into Solomon actually building the temple and we get some pretty significant detail. It's kind of highlighting the usage of the materials. A lot of times it'll say things like he did this, he made this, then he you know, first he laid all the wood in and then when it, that was all ready, then he covered everything with gold. And then he made these two big cherubim inside the inner sanctuary and he carved all of these. Solomon himself didn't do that. All of these skilled artisans that he's hired to do this work, they did it for him. Even though it says he did it, he gets credit for it because he's the one planning and overseeing the entire project. So as the project manager, essentially for this thing, um, he is the one who gets credited with it and we complete the entire account of it in chapter six it says that uh it was started in the fourth year of his reign so four years in he's like all right time to build the temple and then it takes him seven years to complete it so now he's just over a decade into it and he's going to move on to seemingly spending a lot more time building his palace next in second chronicles chapter two we again get a record of Solomon reaching out to Hiram, but we get some different details and neither of these are the exhaustive communication between these two kings, but the emphasis of what's included here kind of points to a little more of the intent of the author and what they're trying to communicate. In Kings, we had a very transactional, hey, good working relationship, want to keep building on that, here's what I'll do for you. In this one, Solomon starts with, now that I've taken over for my father, David, I want to build a house of worship. And here's what we're going to do. We need to do all this stuff that's based around the worship of the Lord, the one true God, Yahweh. And then Hiram replies and um, confirms that the Lord, uh, Yahweh, is looking after his people and that you know David was a wise man. You're a wise man. Let's go for it. I like the deal. We'll do this and we'll totally make it work. And then in chapter three of second Chronicles, we get a much more succinct description of building the actual temple grounds. So we just get, you know, it's a little more concise, but then we get a more detailed description of the most holy place and all the things that were built there. And then the bronze pillars. And then for a little while after, it's going to continue on with all of the things that um, are built at focusing on each of the elements of worship in these descriptions over the next couple chapters in Second Chronicles, as opposed to First Kings, where it was really just, here's what he did, here's what he used, here's the stuff he made. Okay, peace. It took him seven years. This plan that we're reading through is chronological. And so as things are attempting to be arranged in that order, we have things like all of the Proverbs that we just went through after reading about how Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom, then we get examples of his wisdom. Now, as we're reading through, we're going to get 
these parallel accounts. As we continue on, we're going to get, you know, the prophets inserted in there. And when we get to the New Testament, we'll get, you know, one chapter from each gospel lined up where they do and that kind of thing. And trying to piece together more of a chronological timeline according to what sources we have in scripture. And it's a very cool way of reading through and understanding this. In today's passage, something that kind of stands out to me is these two differences in what is recorded as far as Solomon's pitch to King Hiram for, hey, I want to build this thing. I need materials. There is one that's purely business, right? And there's one that's much more focused on worship. And they're both true. They're both real. They're both part of the correspondence and interaction that went back and forth as they're negotiating the terms to build this thing. And I think for us today, it's a really, really good example of what our lives look like, that there is sacred in the mundane in our lives, that in the same things where there are business transactions that we will have to do, those are also always involving us who are people of God indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so there is a certain sacredness and spirituality to everything we do. There are spiritual implications in if we have an integrity or not in the way we do business dealings, in the way that we conduct ourselves and interact with other people. Are we blessing them and using the way that we conduct business, the way that we interact with people out in the world, um, and maybe even, you know, very normal everyday scenarios that have nothing to do with church or evangelism. But those are the moments where our faith is really proved true. Kind of consider even just in a business letter, Solomon includes, Hey, this is the worship we're going to do in this thing. And, uh, you know, we've encountered that as we've set up packs. But, um, one thing that I think was kind of cool is, um, I was working out some stuff for one of the bills for the church, you know, the, one of the utilities, I forget which one, but I, I had to call, I got an office down in Vegas and I get somebody on the line, basic customer service call about a billing issue. Could have been frustrating, could have been annoying, could have been, okay, thanks, fix it. Bye. And I ended up getting to kind of share the vision for our church and then praying with this lady that was on the phone with me, praying that she would have a good day and that she would have favor and grace from the other customers that were going to call in and that kind of thing. It was just being aware like this, that God is moving and is in all things and every even regular run of the mill mundane thing can have a hint of the sacred if we're willing to allow that recognize that from these different perspectives, both sides of that are true. And for us to have integrity in walking with Christ, all of that should be true in us, that we conduct ourselves well in this world and that we represent our God and our faith and the good news of his offer of salvation to all, that we would represent that well in everything we do. And so that's what speaks to me. I would love to hear what stands out to you, what questions or other comments you have. So let's talk about that in the chat or on the Bible app. Thanks for reading with us and joining us today. Be rad for Jesus.